Now this year I have been accumulating shares of Johnson & Johnson and in today's episode we're going to run through why we like this stock. We're going to also take a look at the valuation point right now. What is the intrinsic value at today's date? What is our acceptable buy price given our investor margin of safety? We're going to take a look at their dividend safety, looking at some very important financial metrics, why I still believe even at the current price, Johnson & Johnson is severely undervalued. We're going to take a peek at what the institutions have been doing in 2023. We'll also compare their performance to some others in the industry over the last year and five years. And we'll also touch upon how their performance has been over the last five years in terms of their top line revenue, their bottom line net income and we'll also take a look at their balance sheet quick health check of the company total cash versus total debt and how it's setting itself up for 2024 and beyond now this is one that is towards that 52 week low it did recently touch around 145 dollars and does offer a yield of around 3.07 percent now for those that have been holding this over the last 10 years, you'd be up around 69%. It doesn't include those dividends reinvested, but ideally you would be wanting to get a much higher return on any investment over this period. And we can see in 2022 where it did hit its all-time high, sitting around $183, $184. So let's take a look and run through this company, what we like and some things we do need to be aware of moving into the new year. Now, Johnson Johnson, they did effectively this year have a spin-off with Kenview, so some of these numbers will be inflated, but we will take a look at them nonetheless, just to see how well this company has positioned itself over the last few years. Now, top line revenue, $81.5 billion reported in 2018. Latest annual report January 23, 95 billion. So yes, we like to see 3 to 7% growth year on year. And over the last five years, it has had some very nice growth. On top of that, what is positive to see the trailing 12 months is showing that there will be around a 5 to 6% increase expected into the January 2024 annual report. As always, if you do subscribe and hit that bell button, you will be notified when we receive that report and we run through it. Now, on a more granular level, we do see their top line fairly flat between December 2018 to 2021 before picking up in 2022 and 2023. And it looks like a fairly decent increase into January 24. Now, what does the bottom line show us? What story are we seeing here? Well, 15 billion reported in 2018, around 18 billion in 2023. And we can see a very large increase expected, although we will dissect this when we get the full report. So on a more granular level, we do in fact see a very flat period from 18 to 2021, like we saw on the top line. It does decrease slightly, but you can see fairly flat before picking up and then dropping down. So inconsistent on the bottom line. I would argue you could say that on the top line too, but nonetheless, it is increasing over the longer term, which is ideal and what you want from any company you are investing in. Now, total cash versus total debt. How does that look for Johnson & Johnson? 19.8 billion in December 2018, latest quarter report around 23.5 billion. So they are holding first, they are holding a significant amount of cash. And secondly, this has increased into effectively the latest quarter. And one thing to note before we look at their total debt, this is a company that has a very high graded balance sheet alongside one of the few other companies like Microsoft. Now, when we take a look at their total debt numerically and directionally, we see it has gone down, although very slightly, to around 30.5 billion to 29.9 billion. So, fairly strong balance sheet if on a quick look, but we will also look at the net debt to EBITDA metrics as well as a few others. Now, in terms of their performance years to date versus some well known competitors in the pharmaceutical industry, we have Merck and Co., we have Eli Lilly as well as a few others. Now, year to date, it should come as no surprise. It has been one of the worst performing, down 10%, just second to Pfizer, which has had a horrific year. Do go check out our Pfizer video from yesterday if you want to see what's happening with that company. Now, when we extend that to the last five years, what we do see for Johnson Johnson, not the greatest at 36 37%. You are looking for something significantly higher. But again, as I always say, past performance is an indicator for the future. Now, before we jump into their dividend safety and financial metrics, let's take a quick look at the institutional ownership. Now, it sits at around 68.4%. We can see around $22.5 billion worth of outflows by these big institutions over the last 12 months. 
What we can see here in terms of inflows, slightly larger at around 39 billion over the same period. Now, a few things to note here. Typically, quarter on quarter, there has been more inflows than outflows, with the largest one we can see around 23 billion in Q4 of 2022. But we do see in Q3, the latest quarter, in fact, more outflows than inflows. But over Q1 and Q2, are the opposite. So, as I always say, Yes, it is good to have a look at what the institution's doing, but also do your own due diligence and come up with your own investment thesis for each company you're looking to invest in. So Johnson & Johnson dividend safety score, the highest obtainable at 99, very safe, 374 billion market cap, so it is a mega cap company. Now, in terms of recessionary metrics, well, they increased the dividend during the 0709 recession. Negative 6% sales, yes, that is negative, but for those that want to know, it is above the average growth of companies in the S&P. And they also outperform the S&P 500 with a negative 27% return, with the S&P bringing in a negative 55% return. Now, dividend increases 5.3% this year, which I would say is a small win. I always advocate 4% or more on the channel just to keep in line with inflation. So you are getting a slightly higher than inflationary increase this year as well as locking in essentially a 3.1% yield, which maybe at this time isn't attractive, but when the Fed starts cutting those interest rates, these will become a lot more attractive. And in my opinion, the money will start flooding into these type of companies. Last five years, 6%, again, fairly consistent. Last 20 years, 9%, very nice to see. And I would like, for the foreseeable future, for the increases to be back up to the very high single-digit numbers. Now, Two things to point out here. Firstly, they are a dividend king. They have been increasing their dividends for the last 50 years or more. On top of that, they have paid a dividend for the last 107 years without reduction. And another thing just on this graph, this to me just shows consistency. You know what you're getting with Johnson & Johnson. Now, in terms of dividend yield theory, it states a company is undervalued when that current yield sits above the five-year average. So we see right now 3.06 versus 2.69, our first sign of undervaluation. Bearing in mind, yes, we don't look at any of these models in isolation. And another thing to note, it is one of the highest yields they have paid out over the last five years. Likewise, forward PE sitting at 15 versus a five-year average of 16.4, so another sign of undervaluation. And we can see the PE is 14.9 versus the sector healthcare at 17, so that is a third and final sign of undervaluation. Now, in terms of the payout, it is very important and always do preferably focus on the free cash flow as earnings is susceptible to manipulation by management through accounting. Below 60% is my ideal target for the majority of companies we review on the channel. The reason for this is it means, in my opinion, that management can offer those double digit increases. So what we see here, for the large part, it has been below 60%. 2022, it did come up slightly higher. 23 is expected to go even higher at 76, but note that 2024, they are expecting it to come back down in line with the last 10 years at around 54%. Now, in terms of free cash flow per share, well, 492 in 2013, 655 in 2022, it is increasing, not as consistently as you maybe would like to see, but again, always remember what type of companies are you investing in? Are you investing in some fast-growing tech companies or the more stable, consistent companies? And also do know in 2023, it is expected to come down to around 609, but then up higher in 2024. Now, when we move on to the sales growth, as I always mentioned, 3 to 7% steady moderate growth is really the bare minimum. If anything, you don't want it lower than 3%, otherwise you aren't even keeping up with inflation. So in real terms, it is dropping. But on average, we do see around that 3 to 7%. 2021, a large 14% increase. 22, it has gone down to 1%. Not really good news. But then 2023, expected 16%. So fairly positive in my opinion. And when we look at it holistically, what we can see is it has grown by around 40% over the last 10 years, from 71 billion to 95 billion. And what else do they do? Well, they also do share buybacks. They return excess cash to your pockets. 2.88 billion shares outstanding in 2013, 2.66 billion in 2022. So they have bought back around 220 million shares over the period. In terms of ROIC, remember 10% or more. Otherwise, we shouldn't really be interested in these companies unless they're REITs, which we discuss in detail in our REIT analysis. The reason for this, it does mean management are able to effectively allocate their capital if they do manage to get 10% or more. So very positive. Firstly, it is well above that and to the consistency around that 20 to 23% with 23, 2023, in fact, expected to go higher to 27%. Free cash flow margin, operating margin, very, very positive. 
well above the minimums on the 12% and the 5% and very consistent, which is always positive to see. Consistency is something you really like as an investor. Net debt to EBITDA, well, this shows us two things. One, the balance sheet safety and two, the dividend safety. So we can see the balance sheet looks very strong here. These essentially show us the number of years it would take the company to pay off all of their debt net of cash on hand. 0 0.53 in 2022, 0.19 expected in 2023. So Johnson & Johnson, as we can see, does have a very strong balance sheet and the dividend is as secure as you will ever be able to get in a company, as we saw with that dividend safety score of 99. Now, in terms of the valuation for this company, and as always, if you enjoy the content values being provided, smash that like button, hit the subscribe and bell button so you are able to effectively have these videos drop to your doorstep as and when they are published. And finally, if you do want to grab a copy of the Intrinsic Value Calculator, click on that pinned comment where you can get to the acceptable buy price and intrinsic value of companies in your own portfolio. Jumping into the first model, we have Graham's valuation. We have the stock ticker J&J, &J, earnings per share, growth rate per analyst estimates with that current yield on AAA corporate bonds, coming to an intrinsic value of $112. Now, that is significantly lower not only than the current trading price, but also than the 52-week low. So that is a sign of overvaluation. But bear in mind, we're not looking at any of these models in isolation and we'll draw our conclusions towards the end. Now, multiples valuation model. Those companies we analyze on a five-year total return, we have their P multiples. We have the average multiplied by the earnings per share of J&J &J to get a stock price of 162. Now, when we compare that to the current trading price, around 5% upside and within that 52-week range. So you could argue reasonable slash some slight undervaluation. We then move on to the third model, which is the dividend discount model, the consistent dividend growth company, as I would call them. Average growth rate around 5.75% over the last few years. Forward looking, I've gone for practically the exact same. Although when you do click on the pinned comment below and grab a copy, you can play around with these numbers, whether your investment thesis believes it should be higher or lower. So the DDM price of 223 is even higher than the all-time high. So again, that based on that model, we see some nice signs of undervaluation to the current trading price. Now the final model, the fourth and final, in fact, the DCF discounted cash flow model. We have the free cash flow year on year. Average growth rate around 4%, forward-looking analysts estimating 8%. With that 8% discount rate, we get the present value of future free cash flows and terminal value. Add together with the cash to subtract total debt, get the equity value, divide by shares outstanding to get a DCF price of $204. Similar to the DDM model, above that 52-week high, so another sign of some nice severe undervaluation. Now, the intrinsic model, as always, is just the average of these four models. And as we can see for today's episode for J&J &J is 17563. Now, as always, if you enjoy the content, smash that like button, hit the subscribe and bell button so you do get these videos delivered as they are dropped. Now, margin of safety, as always, we start off with 10% if we believe it has a wide moat, strong financial metrics, good forward looking data. A lot of people will argue that that is applicable for Johnson & Johnson. Now, personally, I would go slightly higher than 10%. At 15% margin of safety, it is around $149. And we can take a look that it's still within the 52-week range. And personally, anything below 149 around 147 148 I have been adding shares of Johnson & Johnson. And if it continues to dip, I will also continue to add. For the long term, when I invest personally, it isn't for the next year or the next five years. We're looking at 10 years or more. At 20%, you are looking around $141. And we can take a look and see that that is slightly lower than the 52 week low. So for me personally, 15% margin of safety or around that is sufficient for Johnson Johnson. I would be interested to hear your thoughts in the comments below. In terms of Wall Street, well, they also see some nice upside over the next 12 months. In fact, slightly higher than our intrinsic value at around, as we can see here, just over 10% upside to the current trading price. As always, though, do let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Is Johnson Johnson one you've been adding this year? Is it one maybe you've been selling due to the spin-off? But then again, there is something just to mention. Finally, there are lawsuits in relation to Johnson & Johnson in terms of their talc powder. So it's not all sunshine and roses. There are lots of other things you also need to consider with your investment. But I would be interested to hear your thoughts on that below. As always, if you've enjoyed the content, smash that like button, hit the subscribe and bell button so you're continually notified. Also, click on that pinned comment below if you do want to grab a copy of the valuation model to get to the acceptable buy price and intrinsic value. Whether that's this Johnson Johnson you want to run through again, whether it's a company that's been on your eye in the market, or even if it's just company in your own portfolio. As always, have a great day and catch you on the next episode. Take care.